TheAdvocateChannel.com looks at the world through the lens of equality and inclusion. Subscribe, like, and share now. AC 24-7's Top Story Countdown continues with our producer's pick for number three. As she celebrates America's independence at a fireworks show here in Boise, Idaho, 70-year-old Pam Hemphill can't help but remember how she felt on July 4th of last year because she was getting ready to go to prison. Even though you were unhappy and scared in prison, you feel you were guilty of what the crime was. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. The January 6th Capitol insurrection. Mother and grandmother Pam Hemphill, who had recently been diagnosed with breast cancer, was there. She had long enjoyed taking video of political events and told police at the Capitol she was a citizen journalist. But she also believed former President Donald Trump's false claims that he won the election. And this is what she was telling people outside the Capitol as she shot her video. Whose house does it belong to? It's my house. Come on in. You just come in. Come on in. She continued shooting video. We are the people. And Pam Hemphill ended up inside the Capitol building. She flew back to Idaho, still believing much of the dogma she had been taught that led to her coming to the Capitol. The Democrats wanted this to be a communist country and that they were um, drinking babies' blood. Did you believe that? No, I thought oh. that was kind of weird. Okay. Um, but did you believe that it was the Democrats wanted this yes. to be a communist country? Yes. It wasn't until months later that Hemphill was arrested on multiple charges. After a plea bargain and pleading guilty to illegal entry to the Capitol, she was sentenced to two months in a federal prison in California. I live with the fear every minute. You just live with it. When she got out of prison this past September, she did have questions about the far right talking points about Trump, but still considered herself a Trump supporter. However, a few months ago, she had a revelation. So when you heard the former president say that he would consider pardoning some J6ers, it changed your mind? Absolutely, 100%. And what did you then think of Donald Trump? That's it. He's just a master manipulator. He doesn't believe anything. He just thinks he's smart enough to pull a wool over you. But there's people like me waking up. And do you feel the former president's responsible for that? Absolutely. He's the king of that gaslighting. It's a cult. It's a cult. And then this happened just about a week and a half ago. A right-wing person wrote something that's inaccurate, but it's important <laughs> to this story. I'm going to read it. American Justice, 69-year-old grandma with cancer, given more prison time for walking inside U.S. Capitol than Hunter Biden for sharing classified documents with foreign regimes and multi-million dollar bribery schemes. And then Donald Trump shared it on his Truth Social with the comment, horrible. When you saw that or heard about it, what was the first thing that went through your mind? I got up, I was very angry, and I said, this is it. This is it. In fact, Hunter Biden recently agreed to plead guilty to two tax misdemeanors to resolve a felony gun charge in exchange for a recommendation of probation. What Pam Hemphill decided to do was call out the former president on social media, writing, please Donald Trump, don't be using me for anything. I'm not a victim of January 6th. I pleaded guilty because I was guilty. Stop the spin. And now Pam Hemphill wants to go back to the US Capitol, but this time to testify under oath about January 6th and she's already prepared what she wants to say if she's invited. I am not a victim of the government. The Justice Department was not weaponized against me. I was a participant. We broke the law. And she talks about the Capitol Police in her speech. In the crowd, I was pushed down. My head was trampled on. My shoulder pulled out. The Capitol Police saved my life that day. I want them to know how truly grateful I am to them and how deeply sorry I am for what happened and how they continue to be treated to this day. Today, Pam Hemphill takes solace in her supportive friends on social media, her family, and God. What would you say to Donald Trump if you could talk to him face to face, like you're talking to me right now? Retire, get honest, because you know, when you meet your maker, you know, that's more important. Like the Advocate channel on Facebook for the best way to get updates on stories that advocate for equality, justice, our rights, and more. AC 24-7 continues with today's top two pick.
July 5th has brought some delays and cancellations to departure boards at airports across the country, but the July 4th holiday weekend as a whole was not the complete meltdown some passengers had feared. Summer travel is booming as millions of Americans skip town for Independence Day getaways. This July 4th period is record-breaking uh, for the travel industry. TSA screened more than 2.88 million people last Friday, the most in a single day since the founding of the agency in late 2001. But a meltdown at United Airlines early last week, followed by severe storms across much of the country, led to long delays and thousands of cancellations leading up to and throughout the holiday travel period. Absolutely horrific. Leaving many passengers stranded Flight got canceled Tuesday, stayed in a hotel. I stood in line for four hours at four o'clock in the morning to rebook the flight. And putting airlines to the test. It was just kind of a catastrophic event. Some airlines were just not able to kind of get on the right foot. Going's Katie Nastro says travelers flying this week should have better luck. I think people should just be cautiously optimistic, not only looking forward into the rest of this week if they're traveling home, but as well looking into the rest of the summer. And if you do have an upcoming trip planned, Nastro says to avoid travel trauma, try to book morning departures, prioritize nonstop flights, and be prepared for crowds. Always give yourself more time than you need, especially uh, the fact that we are going to be seeing more people traveling and again, longer lines uh, pretty much everywhere. Even with the headlines about delays, cancellations and frustrations, there is still a lot of pent up travel demand. Airlines for America, the U.S. airline industry group, expects that during the months June 1st through August 31st, that summer stretch, that U.S. airlines will carry an all time high of 257 million passengers. In Washington, I'm Karen Kafa. Box by box, a summer showdown over abortion in Ohio intensified today as supporters of abortion rights delivered hundreds of thousands of signatures, demanding the issue be placed on the November ballot. These boxes obviously contain signatures of real Ohioans. It's, it's overwhelming. I mean, it's just an absolutely stunning moment. I can't believe we're here. For months, Dr. Aziza Wabi has been part of an effort to gather support to have voters decide whether to enshrine abortion rights in the Ohio Constitution after the U.S. Supreme Court overturned Roe versus Wade and returned the debate back to the states. I was never very political before all of this started last year, so um, this has made me pay more attention, and I think it'll do the same for others. A year after the landmark Dobbs decision, fallout has rippled from courtrooms to the campaign trail, energizing Democrats. Now I stand here, proud to run for re-election. And alarming Republicans. I don't judge anyone for being pro-choice. In Ohio, GOP lawmakers are going to great lengths to stop the abortion rights movement. It started last summer in Kansas, where an abortion measure drew historic turnout for an August election, with a resounding 59% voting to protect abortion rights. Michigan voters followed suit last fall, with 57% voting to change the state's constitution. Those outcomes were so alarming to opponents of abortion rights in Ohio, they are taking the extraordinary step of trying to change the rules in place for more than a century on ballot issues. It's called Issue 1, which seeks to raise the threshold to change Ohio's constitution from a simple majority of 50 percent to a supermajority of 60 percent. Today we're filing over 700,000 signatures. Vote in November and vote in August. The signatures must still be verified by Ohio's Republican Secretary of State, Frank LaRose. At a GOP county dinner, he made no apologies for using the August special election to stop the abortion rights amendment. This is 100% about keeping a radical pro-abortion amendment out of our constitution. The left wants to jam it in there this coming November. Amy Natosi of Protect Women Ohio, a coalition that opposes abortion rights, dismissed suggestions the August election was in any way undemocratic. Ohioans should be reminded of the fact that this is allowing them to determine how their constitution is amended. You know, we've seen the other side saying one person, one vote, this takes away the people's voice. Not at all. This gives the people of Ohio an even bigger voice to decide how their constitution is amended. 